Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, David Chipperfield to the AA. We uh, have been trying to get David to come and give a talk here for quite some time. And uh, it's great that uh, it's finally happened. I think it's also a sort of uh, uh, kind of twice, in a sense, fortunate occasion because uh, the uh, lecture tonight also uh, coincides with the publication of uh, a recent monograph uh, that has just come out by Gustav Yogili, the uh, book in a new series called uh, 2G, which is also going to be available at uh, Triangle after the lecture. So we've done the promotion, and we can stop at this point. Signed copies, yes, signed copies, yes. Well, you might be here all night, so we don't. Um, I'm sure a lot of you were here when Rafael Moneo gave his John Dennis Memorial Lecture a few uh, months ago. And uh, he developed a kind of theoretical discourse in his uh, lecture uh, where he was trying to, in a sense, situate his own work. But uh, the discourse that he developed was the possibility of a kind of counter project in relation to the dualities of uh, uh, the current tendencies towards minimalism and fragmentation. These were the two tendencies that he set out. And in a sense, he developed his own work as a kind of response in relation to uh, these two tendencies. For those people who uh, look at the work of David in the context of some other practices, I think, uh, especially in the UK, his work might also be seen as having certain, uh, in a sense, affiliations with uh, some uh, uh, work that might be categorized as minimalist, but I think uh, to my way of thinking, this is uh, um, uh, far from, uh, from uh, precise or, or accurate in a way, because uh, the work of uh, David Chipperfield is uh, very uh, unique in the context of, uh, of British practice. It, it uh, uh, problematizes the work of architecture beyond any uh, stylish, stylistic tendencies of, uh, of minimalism. And in that sense, I think it probably has um, more similarities or, or affiliations with some of the practices maybe in, in Austria or in Switzerland rather right, than the UK. And this, I think, is, is, uh, is somehow a pity for, uh, for current uh, British practice. Uh, David has told me a few times in the last uh, couple of months that during the last eight years, uh, the practice has only done one project, which is the River and Rowing Museum in, in Henley. And uh, in the context of all the other projects that are going up in the, in the UK, I think uh, one should really uh, somehow uh, find a possibility for, for, for this practice to be doing uh, a lot more work than, than it is doing. And I think we all need to promote, in a sense, or support the, uh, the, the office so that they do get uh, uh, more jobs. Um, so uh, I really hope that, uh, that some, uh, some major projects come along. In any case, the practice is uh, uh, doing still very, very well uh, with many, many projects uh, uh, throughout Europe. In terms of the background, I'm sure most of you know that David trained at the AA and worked for uh, Douglas Stevens, Richard Rogers, and Foster Associates. He was a founder member and director of the Nine Age Gallery and is a trustee of the Architecture Foundation. He's been visiting professor of architecture at Harvard, at the University of Graz in Austria, the Royal College of Art, and the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne in Switzerland, and is currently a professor in uh, Stuttgart. David Chipperfield Architects was established in 1984 and has since carried out work in Europe, USA, and Japan. The firm's reputation has been established by a series of high-profile commissions, especially interiors and small-scale projects. The studio continues to work on small-scale commissions and has built up a reputation for the design of shops for several fashion designers uh, these, uh, and, and, and a number of uh, uh, designs for furniture. In 1987, David Chipperfield Architects opened an office in Tokyo where they designed uh, 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 in addition to interior projects, three buildings have been completed, a private museum in, in Tokyo, a showroom building in Kyoto, and a headquarters building in Okayama. Uh, this early work has resulted in prestigious <laughs> commissions on large scale for, building, 
for public buildings and cultural institutions that include the Arnolfini Gallery in Bristol, the River and Rowing Museum in Henley, and the Natural History Museum in London. Current projects under construction include the restoration of the Grazi Museum in Leipzig, a studio building in Dusseldorf, and a private villa in Berlin, which has just been uh, finished. In 1993, David Chipperfield was awarded the biannual Palladio Prize in, in Vicenza for a building in Kyoto. Other awards include, in 1991, the Financial Times Award Special Mention, 1991, the Italstadt Europe Award, Honorary Mention and Best Building Award for an office building in Okayama, Japan. And in 1996, uh, the First Church of Christ Scientists won an RIBA Regional Award. The uh, Practices River and Rowing Museum is now among the finalists for the Miss Van der Rohe Prize. Would you please join me in welcoming David Chipperfield? Thank you very much. Um, uh, there is a serious side, I hope, to, uh, <coughs> to the fact that um, we haven't received <coughs> uh, commissions to the new buildings in England, <coughs> um, and I don't really want to play much more on the pathos <coughs> that uh, <coughs> Moisson kindly um, uh, started off. <coughs> but there is, I have to say, something slightly peculiar about um, continuously working outside of one's culture. In that context, I'm very grateful for uh, Gustavo Gilli, the publishing house, uh, for um, uh, continuously, I must say, supporting my career. They, they um, published my work in a monographic um, series, I think, five years ago, maybe, 92, <coughs> um, when I was a young lad. Um, and uh, the very handsome volume, which you can buy downstairs, is, uh, you know, another very important for us sort of collection of, of projects because um, it is a sort of rather disparate and uh, messy um, career or you know way of working and that process is uh, not anchored by working uh, as a practitioner in one's own culture but in a much more subversive way I guess um, finding opportunities wherever they m might lay, um, lie, and uh, those have characteristically been, on the one hand, uh, small-scale projects in this country and elsewhere, and the opportunities um, offered by, first of all, Japan, as Moisen said, and most recently by Germany. Um, working outside of one's culture uh, makes the operation, of course, technically much more difficult. But it also makes one more um, self-conscious about uh, what one is fulfilling, you know, what, what one's role is. I want to start with the first slides because no, it says light. Is that what I need to do? No, someone else is going to do the lights. That's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's my way. That's me. <coughs> um, thought I'd gone conceptual, didn't you? Uh, there is, there is a, a strange um, divergence within the profession between theory and practice and I think in this culture more than any other that divergence um, is quite extreme. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable um, to believe that <coughs> one should uh, continuously maintain uh, one's position these are the both of these um, uh, considerations. <coughs> I believe that architecture finally is something which is measured by architecture, by a building. Um, I'm not, I have 
little sympathy for um, what might be described as you know, the narrative of architecture, the idea that <coughs> there is a script which, by which you understand a building which runs parallel to architecture. I believe that um, ideas must be resolved and must be made manifest by building itself. That immediately, uh, first of all I should say that does not discount the idea of purely theoretical work or investigation as um, something which fuels our profession and I think you know there are um, you know as a stimulus <coughs> one admires and enjoys the work of those uh, people that you know stimulate us that way um, however for most of us you know those of us that um, are <coughs> less um, um, you know, profound in, in our ambitions um, have to demonstrate idea, I think, through, through architecture. And again, that's not to justify that um, building uh, is, the only, is the only issue. I don't see any point of building without idea. Ideas of architecture are um, often informed by the process of building and therefore the relationship between theory and practice, between the uh, realization and to the making um, um, apparent of idea and making that um, process uh, clear through building is one where clearly one has to build. I will try and um, show, I'm going to be as brief as possible because <coughs> this was meant to be a sort of reception where we all had a drink and um, celebrated a monograph and instead you've got to listen to me talk about architecture which <coughs> wasn't how this started off but um, I will show a number of projects and but the theme well the themes I want to talk about I guess first of all um, is this idea that <coughs> architecture must show idea through the way it's practiced. Um, secondly, <coughs> I suppose as an underlying um, uh, notion or definition, therefore, uh, of what are the limits of architecture? What, what is architecture capable of doing and talking about? Um, and I think, again, that is quite profoundly um, change through the history of the modern movement. Okay. Um, I would refer um, or there's been a reference to the work in, in Japan which was terribly important to me. Um, not only the process of building because the Japanese very nicely gave me an opportunity to build um, sort of medium-sized projects, which is, you know, the stuff by which architects can learn their trade. It's very difficult, you know, I couldn't have got those and still don't get those opportunities in this country and therefore working in Japan, <coughs> you know, gave me that opportunity. But as well, um, there was something very um, extraordinary about really doing my first buildings. Um, in a culture which uh, I knew very little about. And it made me very self-conscious about what, how I could give significance to that work. Where, where could ideas come from if, as I do, refute the idea that um, you know, we should uh, generate architecture from the, the genius of the architect or the fantasy of the architect. I think that the one positive aspect I would say about working in England <coughs> is that the hand of resistance is pretty firm, but that hand of resistance in a strange way um, makes one, I suppose, resolute about what it is one's trying to do, why is it one's trying to push. In Japan, um, there was, there's no hand of resistance. Um, there's very little planning control. 
Um, if there is planning control, it's more to do with the heights of buildings and setbacks and things like that. There is absolutely no aesthetic control. Um, you can make a building look like you want, and, uh, anything you want, and, and most people there do. Um, and therefore, in this sort of strange, I found myself jumping from, from one culture where, <coughs> you know, if you, if you um, designed a window, you'd have four people sitting around the table asking you why it wasn't Georgian, um, to a culture where um, people were rather disappointed if you didn't, you know, paint the building pink. Um, and, of course, this, this uh, extraordinary freedom is, is a sort of, uh, is uh, intimidating. So there were two, two problems. First of all, what to do with freedom, <coughs> and secondly, how to give meaning or significance to um, building outside of one's own culture. What I discovered in the years that I was in Japan, of course, is that <coughs> there are certain things common to us all, and there are certain things which um, one can find within Japanese work, and certain contemporary architects like Tado Ando um, elaborate in contemporary work, uh, which have a certain um, timelessness and to some degree a certain universality. Um, now I don't, I'm not, I'm not making, you know, uh, um, claims towards um, those ambitions, but um, I was concerned about how to make an architecture that people, you know, that would, would mean something. And within that, uh, the tradition, the Japanese tradition of making space and presenting or representing context was uh, not only an exciting, you know, realization, which is pretty obvious. Um, uh, to anybody that's looked at traditional architecture, but it's, it's a very pure architectural notion. In other words, you, um, you, know, you can abstract. I mean, the, the, the Japanese city, <coughs> one has to say, is a sort of, seems to be a visual chaos. We all know that the Japanese are so ordered and so well organized that this chaos is only a sort of superficial chaos, and underneath this is, you know, most extraordinarily um, well-organized society. So it's not a real chaos. But visually, the city offers very little context, and therefore buildings tend to look in on themselves, and you know, Japanese space tends to be um, self-described on the one hand, which is maybe the slide on the right, a, you know, a space absolutely in the heart of a building. Um, or on the left, is to do with sort of pinching context, it's to do with representing context. All of a sudden, once you're 10 meters above the city of Kyoto, which on the ground level looks like absolute chaos, once you're 10 meters above, you can look at the city with another eye, and the city, you can present the city with another sort of sense of beauty. Um, and <coughs> those were the things which I, I enjoyed about Japan. I suppose the other thing which left a, a deep sense uh, or a deep um, influence on me was um, the sort of definition of, of limit or the simplicity of ambition that existed in very simple things. I suppose one might term it best by <coughs> the idea of making very normal things special. The placing of a, you know, I don't want to sound over romantic about Japanese and <coughs> or be, you know, uh, and of course one has to be terribly cautious about, you know, the exotic. But <coughs> um, there is a sense of, of taking very simple things and by the way that you present and by the way that you can consider them, you elevate this simplicity into being something rather special. And that goes from the, you know, taking a bath or putting a cup on the table. You know, the cup is always just turned slightly um, as it's placed, as if to signify that that side's a better, you know, the sort of self-consciousness of the move. Um, and and that, 
that uh, idea of ritualizing the normal uh, seems to me to have uh, a profound um, uh, place within, uh, you know, uh, a profession which, which is concerned with physical things. Oops, why didn't I get that? Sorry. Um, so, working in Japan was one career. Parallel to that <coughs> um, was sort of frock shops in Bond Street. Um, and that process, um, in a way, is a rather different one. Although, again, one of trying to, to, to be consistently self-conscious about um, the significance of doing that. I'm not saying it's not valuable work. In fact, I think probably, um, probably we had a reasonable amount of success by taking such, such things seriously. I think the generation of architects before me wouldn't have done such a thing. Um, having left the AA, uh, having been taught by architects who I thought were um, you know, profoundly um, capable and, and seeing them not have work, one was only too grateful to have a, you know, a shop to do as, as uh, you know, one's expectations, I guess, were, were not, not to do universities and public buildings in the way that the generation before me had been. Um, the, the small work, therefore, we took reasonably seriously, and I think we still do, and there were sort of traps, you know, one's continuously aware of the traps of doing work, especially within the fashion industry, first of all, not to become fashionable, and in a way to look for those things which you can learn from yourself without abusing the context. Um, you know, your first responsibility if you're going to design a shirt that sells, sh a shop that sells shirts is, um, you know, to sell shirts, <coughs> not to do, you know, an architectural statement. Um, because otherwise, <coughs> um, in a way, intellectually, you've let the whole logic down. However, I don't think it, I, I, in our case, I think it meant that, or we were fortunate to have a number of clients who allowed us uh, the freedom, um, I suppose, to invest these projects with um, uh, s investigations about material and, and uh, forms and, and uh, things like that, which were probably not run-of-the-mill interior design. The other thing I would say, which has been a profound lesson, is that in architecture uh, we are always speculating about a reality. And that speculation is done through another medium, the medium of drawing or model making or whatever. We, are, we do not have the, the, the uh, project as an as a indirect relationship. We're not like a painter that you know, puts something on the canvas, sits back and sees what he thinks. You know, there isn't that. We are, in, those, in that reference, we're making a sketch for someone to do a, a painting. We are, you know, novel writers <coughs> making a sort of specification about how to write a novel um, without the direct relationship with our medium. And that's a very, I think, a very difficult thing for, for architecture, and it's increasingly difficult because it puts us further and further away from the directness of material or physical decisions. We often do drawings about elevations where we're deciding the position of windows. And I suspect a lot of the time one is deciding, you know, how that window looks best on the drawing. It's very difficult sometimes to, to know whether that is a real, what I would call a real decision or a graphic decision. In these small projects, we're always dealing very firmly with um, real things. They're done, you know, within three or four months, the drawings are, uh, you know, I wouldn't say insignificant, but they are a very minor part of the making process. The making process is a much more direct one than normal. And to some degree, <coughs> that it 
gives you a certain confidence in uh, simple material decisions. Um, one other point <coughs> I would say about our work and, and, the, <coughs> and um, the problems of, of design and I suppose justifying <coughs> why we continue to do small things and their relationship to doing bigger things. <coughs> um, as architects, we, we often, <coughs> or we continuously look for uh, theoretical, theoretical justification for the decisions we make. <coughs> and architecture is actually rather easy. You can hide decisions very easily in, in building you know, giving form. You can always um, give <coughs> uh, a structural justification, a cost justification, an energy just you know, we can, we can um, rationalize our efforts through a whole series of things. And in the end, the thing that we're most uncomfortable about talking about, of course, is, athe is aesthetics and form. So we don't, you know, we tend not to do that. We tend to sort of you know, the high-tech architects talk about speed of construction, the efficiency of, you know, insulation, etc., etc. <coughs> um, there's very little justification about why the thing looks like that. <coughs> um, but in our English pragmatic culture, uh, you know, we're always suckers for that sort of um, justification and description. When you're making a table, um, or uh, a chair or uh, a bowl, uh, one is left uh, rather naked, you know, in, in the sense that you cannot describe the problem in any complex way. You, know. the, you cannot give um, any uh, functional description to a chair apart from the fact that it's, you know, you have to be able to sit on it and comfort ought to be part of that, but comfort, of course, is, you know, is a subjective thing, and, and it's something where you have to find a relationship between, you know, making a form, making it serve, it, you know, suit its, its function, but finally you're making an object which somehow s has significance and meaning, which is probably the most difficult thing to talk about. And in that sense, I'm showing these two things, which on the left is a chair, a series of um, chairs we did for Interlubka in, in Germany, and on the right, I was invited to make any object I wanted by a Belgian company, and I chose a bowl. Um, and what interested me, I'm not showing these because they're, you know, wonderful uh, industrial, or examples of industrial design, rather that as a sort of metaphor, what fascinates me about as I say, the nakedness of the position of having to design things like this, uh, it probably, you know, I think in a fairly realistic way exposed to me um, what uh, I was in, I'm interested in. That is that I believe that at this point within the modern movement, we are free from what might be described as, you know, a, ri a radical position. Uh, we've invented and reinvented and justified and given vision so many times that in, uh, and failed so consistently that um, I'm uh, absolutely suspicious of large ideological um, justifications. And instead, I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, you know, and especially in an English condition where we have two seemingly, you know, irresolute conditions. One is, you know, the fogies and the conservatives who are only interested in those things uh, that can be seen to be part of, you know, a glorious past. And on the other hand, um, you know, a whole camp of people that only, you know, can't cope with um, the me what I would say, what might, you know, what might term as, the, you know, the meaning of things. In other words, um, the definition of, of history and, and where we are as some sort of continuum between the past and the future. Okay, a few projects, and I'll, I'll, I'll go very quickly through them. <coughs> um, this was the first um, project.
project, the first building we did, it was in England, um, a small house for a photographer. And um, in the same way, as I just said, I think the private house um, doesn't allow a functionalist or deterministic description. Um, we can turn it into one, you know, we can turn it like architects always do, you know, we can always give a sort of um, justification, but in the end, <coughs> um, there isn't much functional about a house apart from a place where you, you know, you cook, you go to the bathroom and you sleep. From then on in, um, I, in my view, everything else is experiential and everything is to do with making the passage of your days, you know, the, the ritual of your daily life, more or less enjoyable. Um, and it, I don't believe that one can, you know, look for much more than that. Um, in this house, we were posited in a street, a 1950s um, <coughs> semi-detached houses. Uh, rather, uh, the, the neighbors were, of course, completely upset with uh, the idea a modern house would be built in their midst and uh, put a petition to Prince Charles to try and get him to, to intervene. Um, luckily, he was sort of preoccupied with other things at the time, I think. <laughs> Um, what was interesting was that the houses in the street all um, made great gestures to the front and the relationship with the garden was rather um, uh, closed. We on the other hand wanted to reverse that and integrate, I suppose in this sort of um, what I was talking about in Japanese work, you know, borrow um, the context which we, we felt was um, positive, in other words, the view or the garden that we were making, uh, light, um, and, and I was interested in you know, making a series of rooms using very simple materials that um, encouraged, I suppose, just the, the daily ritual of life. Uh, in that process, we, we made this sort of arch which redefined, this is the width of the garden, and it redefined, um, well, it support, it, it acts as structure holding up the back of the house and allows the living room, which is this, to be very sort of open to the garden and sort of redefines the, the sort of, the, the definition between the inside and the outside of the house. So rather surprisingly, um, the room is sort of thrown out into the garden and borrows um, the garden as part of its, you know, of its atmosphere and its, or its um, yeah, um, identity. On the other hand, this frame um, encloses a sort of small courtyard which holds the two parts of the house together. When I, I teach in Germany, and when I, if I, the times I've shown this slide, people are absolutely, you know, amazed because in Germany you can't do this type of uh, glazing, you know, it's you, the insulation regulations are as such that that wouldn't work. The, the project <coughs> really tried to revolve around the, um, the making of spaces, the, the reduction, <coughs> Moisson referred to, to minimalism, which I absolutely do not see myself part of. Um, I think minimalism has now become a sort of a decorative uh, style. It's no longer uh, the idea of, s of stripping back of, you know, of an essentialism, which I think is much more, more interesting. The idea of doing, you know, um, you know not doing too much and uh, making spaces, using nice materials, engaging daylight um, and uh, refiguring context seems to be, you know, um, a sufficient palette and a sufficient series of concerns and, and um, games. Uh, going back to the Japanese um, context, what was interesting was that the frame, you know, not only uh, you know, held this little terrace, as it were, you know, by an arm into the, into the building, so that it wasn't something superficial to it, it was actually within the body 
of the building, which reinforced this ambiguity between inside and outside. But it also, in this, um, you know, make the normal special idea, uh, frames the garden. And a rather normal garden is made to seem, you know, like a picture. Um, <coughs> this is Berlin. This is the house we've just finished. I'm handing it over on Wednesday, in fact. So I don't have the final photos. <coughs> um, it's uh, a building for a very senior um, uh, political figure in, in Germany. Um, a certain amount of security hangs around this project, and so I'm not allowed to tell you too much about it. <coughs> um, but uh, the, well, yeah, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I get into terrible trouble. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, he's, not a, he, he's not a politician, but he is a, he's, a, he's a sort of big player. And we were told at the beginning that uh, it would be, um, you know, there would have to be bulletproof glass and things like this, and that seemed to me not a problem. Uh, little did we know at that point that the bullet, when the, you know, bulletproof glass I always imagine is about, <coughs> you know, three quarters of an inch thick. Here it was two and a half inches thick. Every piece of glass is uh, 60 millimeters <coughs> thick, which um, meant that we weren't building a house, we were building a series of windows which propped up a house. Um, the, s the structure of the building supports the windows. Um, the bricks sort of come along free. The, there were two, I started, I suppose, with a number of preconceptions, and, and this, you know, I want to continue the discussion of context. Um, I got very excited when Moisson mentioned Raphael Moneo, uh, thinking that he'd draw parallels between my work and Moneo's, of course. <laughs> he didn't at all, he just sort of... <laughs> um, and um, I am very impressed by the work of Monet, uh, because he sees every project as another project. He doesn't bring um, uh, a preconceived architectural idea to the project. And I suppose, I mean, I, don't, I have no choice, I guess, um, insofar, you know, one day it's Korea, another day it's Spain, another day it's Berlin. Um, it would be preposterous. Uh, to bring, uh, not that architects don't, but it would be preposterous to bring um, a preconceived um, formal idea to these projects. And therefore, I am <coughs> very interested, and I suppose this comes from the Japanese experience, I'm very interested to, to find ideas of context. <coughs> I was always told that context was, you know, was about lining things up with other buildings in the street and, you know, the context of plan. But I think it's a much more, and this is where Monet was very coherent, <coughs> um, it's a very, um, context can be uh, very many things, and, it, and you can be influenced by a lot of, of different, uh, you know, dimensions. <coughs> Building a, a villa <coughs> for, um, uh, let's call him, you know, a serious figure, um, and someone that couldn't be very visible from the street, uh, I had the feeling that the, the project wasn't, you know, a sort of light and playful thing. Um, you know, a rather different sort of client than, let's say, a fashion photographer or, you know, someone from an advertising agency. Um, I also came with certain preconceived notions about, you know, a Berlin villa with reference to the, to the Mies um, early brick villas and the, um, uh, the villas of Mendelssohn. Also, what, how could, what, I mean, we, I tend to want to decide a material of the project very early on because for me that tends to define its characteristic. And um, brick uh, in a sort of suburban context seemed to me to, to continue and draw out an idea of 
domesticity or, or might give um, an otherwise potentially rather monumental, and, and if there's a criticism of this project, you know, I make it before anybody else does, um, that it probably, it possibly is a little bit over monumental, but the, the brick was meant to humanize it, let's say. Um, and also to participate in <coughs> a relationship between you know, form and form making and texture. You can see here, I mean, I can tell you we had a nightmare um, trying to persuade uh, the Germans that, uh, or the German construction company that <coughs> um, we could use a brick that wasn't actually German brick size. Uh, and of course, this, this threw up uh, a contemporary problem about products, the debate between products and materials. Um, the building was set out on dimensions of bricks. I mean, we had to draw every brick on the, on the site, but of course, in a ha when it's a handmade brick, every brick is a different size. And traditionally, the craftsman would resolve that by, if you know, he knew he had seven bricks left to get to the end of that point, and um, he would work out, <coughs> you know, if there was a longer one, he'd put a shorter one next to it. When I explained to the contractor that's what he had to do, um, he didn't look very happy. He wasn't a happy chappy. Um, but that's, you know, what they had to do. And that's a, that's a sort of uh, engagement of skill, which I, it's not that I'm not obsessed with skilling up the, the site again, but um, one realizes in the process of building uh, in sort of contemporary climate that uh, there isn't much patience anymore for materials which don't behave in exactly the way you imagine them, you know, you prescribe. And then we're rather surprised that buildings end up looking synthetic. The building faces <coughs> uh, south onto the street. And as I said, the, 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 the building has to have a sort of privacy from the street. So the idea is that there's a, there's a sort of courtyard tucked behind here. This is the southwest, or this is the south corner. So the form is cut to allow light to come into the, into the middle of the house through this courtyard. Um, we went a bit mad with the bricks. The bricks are uh, everywhere. Uh, and uh, there was an idea of just, you know, making this um, monolithic uh, uh, form. And I suppose investing this brickwork with a sort of texture um, and contrasting that texture, which will, of course, mature and, you know, start going green in certain places and will take on a patina and, and, and uh, you know, uh, contrasting that with the sort of fineness uh, and, and geometric ideas of, of form. Um, this is, uh, that's still the front, that's the stairs taking you up. I should say that this, the street is three meters below the garden level. These are two guest bedrooms onto the front garden. This is the courtyard, um, and you can see from here that we, we took the brick absolutely everywhere, and we developed um, techniques of hanging the bricks so that there was this, we didn't get this normal problem which occurs you know, that you have a row of bricks here, and then on that line there, you'll have a sort of plasterboard ceiling, which, you know, in two years, you get a yellow stain here or something like that. You know, that so we, I was interested in the idea that the surface was absolutely monolithic. And that the material should somehow, you know, generate um, ideas, not so much of construction, but of, of surface and form. The courtyard which sits on the south corner, which um, the living rooms look into, has a sort of staircase which connects back down um, to the garden on the north side. And then when you come through on the, that stair went down here, there is a sort of swimming pool in the basement here, which is on grade level to the street, but the garden level is up here, 
which is here. That's the slot here, which connects these two outside spaces. I suppose the other thing which I enjoyed in Japan and worked through the projects um, was <coughs> that I, I think probably all the projects start with the making of space and making of rooms. And the, the making of those rooms doesn't stop necessarily at the skin of the building, but tries to um, confiscate and, and form outside spaces as much as anything within, the, within that sequence. So that there's a sort of sequence of interior spaces, but that sequence, uh, as it were, carries on and, and keeps going as far as it can into the, into the site. That also, I think, explains you know, ideas of, of pushing uh, windows back into the facades in order to make uh, you know, a sort of playfulness of, of, um, of form making and space making. Um, I should say that we, we, we work always with models, we always work with large scale models, 1 to 30, which is the first scale which you can um, <coughs> uh, play with both interior and exterior form, interior space and exterior form. Um, I can't envisage making a project where you're not, um, you know, that you develop a form and then you sort of work inside and work, you know, sort of divide it up. I think the projects, I, would, I think I can say honestly that um, there is always a continuous backwards and, and a forwards movement between making of rooms and making of form. Um, we persuaded the client who has a collection of uh, paintings who originally wanted very tall double height spaces or a series of double height spaces um, I persuaded them away from that and instead we have two living rooms which are four meters tall which is these um, so they're like a sort of bel etage rooms which are you know <coughs> surprisingly high but th the same height as one would expect on you know uh, a 19th century building and what's nice about that is that you start to get proportions within the elevation, which, you know, that's four meters, and so that's, you know, 2.5. So, again, there's a sort of um, uh, contortion, a volumetric contortion, which happens both uh, internally within the spatial sequence, because all the spaces are <coughs> different proportions, um, and uh, externally represents itself in form. <coughs> These are the two joining living rooms. One facing to the garden to the north and this you can see conveniently the sun is coming through the courtyard is there these are uh, all sliding uh, doors with as I say 60 millimeter uh, glass in they're so heavy you can't slide them by hand they're all on motors so you it's all This is looking from the dining room into the, the courtyard. <coughs> the courtyard is fully covered in brick, <coughs> and so it, it takes on the character of another room. Um, this is looking from the entrance hall to the, through the living room to the garden. This is the entrance hall. When you arrive, you come in, and there's a tall space which goes through the building. Um, the living room is that way, the stair going up is there, and the stair to the basement is there, or, and the arrival stair from the garage is coming from here. This is the view to the dining room. Um, that was the stair coming from the garage up to the main hall. <coughs> because this will be the way that the client will always arrive, in other words, he parks his car and enters, you know, we start, we considered this as a sort of main entrance to the house, and so it arrives, it puts you, uh, you know, absolutely in, in the entrance hall opposite the front door. This is the swimming pool. It's fairly obvious. Um, bathroom. Um, <coughs> in contrast to the, to the outside, the whole of the inside is a sort of sculpted white series of, of volumes, again, you know, enjoying um, uh, top light and daylight and, and trying to, I suppose, you know, there's a sort of landscape which comes out of just uh, the manipulation of, of room sizes and volumes, the 
orientation of the window, it, each room only has one window. It's like one elevation of every room is one window. Um, and in other places, the light through the roof. Um, changing context, and, and <coughs> I purposely contrast uh, these, this last project and this one. It's another house um, and a completely different place. <coughs> this is um, Spain, the northwest corner of Spain, Atlantic Spain, it's not um, Mediterranean Spain, Galicia, um, directly west of. Uh, Santiago, and here is the Atlantic Sea, you know, the next thing is America, nothing between that and, uh, and you know, you can see this type of uh, brooding, <coughs> rain-filled Atlantic <coughs> sky. It's a very different uh, um, sky to, you know, the south of Spain. Um, there's a, a fishing village in a sort of protected bay, it's here. The coast then goes, so this is in fact uh, nearly, you know, the open sea is this way. It's a very convenient harbour here. The coast then goes sort of straight down here and there's a very beautiful beach. Um, our site is, is here in the middle of this um, uh, facade in a way. You know, the, the village which is this and it, it strings along, along the, the sort of harbour here. Um, and there's the site right there, a very sort of awkward, nearly triangular <coughs> site, sits in this um, village wall. Um, it's a fishing village and unlike um, in Cornwall or, you know, English fishing villages where the fishermen sold their, their houses years ago um, and there isn't a fisherman to be seen in in a Cornish fishing village, and if you want fish, it's got to be you know, brought on the train. Um, in, in Galicia, the fishermen still seem to be rather rich. <coughs> um, and of course, English fishermen will claim that's because they pinch all our fish. Um, and the Spanish newspapers will claim it's because they smuggle drugs. Um, and I suspect it's a bit of both. Anyway, they all still own their, own, their houses. The place is only for the fishermen. Um, and, of course, the last thing that fishermen want to do when they come home is look at the sea. So, <coughs> the, the windows to the sea are, you know, tiny little uh, windows. So, you get this, you know, wonderful, spectacular view, one of the most beautiful views of the sea you can imagine, <coughs> and facades with little windows. Not only that, you have this sort of uh, absolutely informal relation to planning codes, <coughs> where this guy decides, you know, he can build five floors and this one is only three. <coughs> and the problem for us in this context was that, <coughs> um, you know, of course, what we wanted to take uh, advantage from our side of, of the sea and how to do that without, um, in a way, or with how to do that and still participate within this uh, facade. <coughs> So the strategy was, was to, um, in a way, build a bridge. So there's a part of the building which is, which is like a bridge, which takes this small window architecture, you know, the, w the window in the wall uh, system, and it spans across from this building to this building. Not only does it do that, but it, it takes this height and steps down and joins here. So it's a really, it's a bridge of s surface and, and uh, you know, form. And tucked under that bridge is a, is a hole. You know. And it's that hole which provides the window and this spectacular view to the sea. <coughs> from, the s from the other side you can see that this, um, this is a meeting of geometries. So there's an extraordinary series of planes which are coming in from different angles, uh, different uh, projections which we can we're can take advantage of. So it became, uh, whereas I have to say, you know, there's a tendency in my work to sort of regularize and straighten things out, <coughs> um, that was a rather um, 
limited uh, exercise on this project. Uh, and uh, instead, uh, I realized it was going to be a game of, uh, as it were, pulling things in, of taking the geometries, as many geometries as possible, into the project, incorporating this uh, strange um, uh, silhouette into the project, incorporating all, all of the angles, and incorporating this, um, you know, window structure. <coughs> The, the beach is, is two meters lower than the street. <coughs> here's the sort of bridge piece, I guess. And here's the, the room with a view here. Um, that's not to say, of course, that small windows don't provide a view. You know, you get a very different idea of view. This is the lowest level, a series of bedrooms that open out for children onto the beach. They can come straight out down to the beach. And this is the upper level, master bedrooms, <coughs> and again in order to um, give another dimension to this, uh, this bridge, in, in order to stop it just being a series of small things, um, I introduced this sort of courtyard, this little um, cut, this terrace, this covered roof terrace, which in a way provides even more surface and holes into this uh, bridge, yet at the same time brings one element of a, of a larger order. So in a way it signifies, you know, the idea that the building is turning and looking <coughs> to the view in the way that the other ones don't. On the rear elevation, the, the geometries are even more complex. It's really happening at the corner of two of a street turning. And the geometries are completely taken in to the building. Um, it's not that we haven't done the windows yet, there aren't any here. There's a door coming here and there's a window to a bathroom here. This is the stair, so there's the door you come in. Um, so literally, in order to emphasize this, the plastic quality, you know, the sort of um, sculptural nature of this um, uh, formalism, of, of taking this, and, and the surface is kept absolutely without a window. So you can see, you know, this line is taken through, this line is taken through, this line is taken through. So it, the, the project confiscates all of the, the irregularities of the site and sort of implodes them into. Okay, um, two more projects very quickly. Um, <coughs> uh, this is a, a competition that we did for uh, an auditorium in Bristol. I noticed that um, Benish is speaking tomorrow. Um, <coughs> I'm glad you kept us one evening apart because <laughs> uh, we lost this competition to him. Um, and uh, it was a competition for a concert hall to provide two halls and to provide them in um, a, a sort of uh, Dockland situation. This is the, you know, the old docks of Bristol. You can just see the cathedral here. Uh, this is the old uh, a warehouse here, which I worked on 10 years ago for the Arnold Feeney. They're sort of big structures. You can see here, you know, there are warehouse buildings, very big, um, strong, um, typical Dockland structures. <coughs> um, I was told that um, I alienated one of the jury by criticizing this building here, uh, um, which was a building built by, I think it was by Arabs for Lloyds, and I was quite damning of this building, which clearly wasn't an astute political move, <coughs> given that the architect was on the jury, but um, <coughs> I used it as an example of not what to do, which was very clever. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's, it was its pretentiousness that uh, I objected to mostly insofar that it, they, they made this sort of curved building. There was an idea to make a civic space. And of course, in Bath and Bristol, you know, John Wood the Elder and John Wood the Younger, you go to, to the, you know, you see this wonderful crescent. So obviously the architect saw this and thought, well, wonderful, I can make a contextual building. And uh, proceeded to make a sort of a crescent, a very formal piece of architecture and a sort of formal uh, space in the middle of a very tough, 
Dockland, you know, waterside uh, context, uh, which you know sat there in a rather sad isolation for a number of years. We had to therefore participate in this, you know, ridiculous space that was set up here um, by making a building on this site. And my argument was that <coughs> um, this was not a civic site, and although the project, to some degree, you know, it was for a civic building the context of the docks was, was a rather different one. And we've seen it in our own Docklands, you know, I mean, if, if anyone has an experience in how to screw up Docklands, the British of, you know, world leaders, um, you know, we took a very nice, uh, strong uh, Docklands and turned it into a sort of office park by the water. Um, so I was very concerned that something of the spirit of this place should, should somehow, you know, uh, prevail. The second thing that I was anxious about <coughs> was the specific problem of designing concert hall, um, and in this case, two halls. Uh, halls often, well, halls get their basic body form from acoustics and from sight lines and all sorts of other things which are not within one's formal control. They, they tend to, they're things which develop for other reasons, and you end up with, with a building which has a rather extraordinary shape. Um, my concern was how on a small site, and you saw the, ge the geometric um, complexity of that site, how could you mediate between um, these forms which are going to be massive and the urban context of the site. Uh, you know, concert halls don't have windows, so in the end you get these great big um, elephantine forms clad in something sitting in a rather irregular way. I was I took from Sol Lewitt this uh, image <coughs> of the cage, and then we abstracted the idea of these, uh, you know, m um, represent the two concert halls, and this represents the public spaces that we, we were allowed to have. So the idea was that you could sit <coughs> um, the, the concert halls, which want to be funny shapes, inside uh, another box which could have uh, the possibility of mediating between the, the hall and the site. So then we looked at ways of um, colliding the boxes. We looked at how that might work within this context of how these boxes might sit together. <coughs> and then we thought about, or we elaborated, the material and physical idea of the project insofar that one could start to imagine that the outside box, especially in this sort of waterside Dockland condition, could be a sort of tectonic wooden frame um, because it does nothing, doesn't have to do anything else but enclose. On the other hand, the concert hall has to be a sort of monolith. Um, it has to have mass. It's got to isolate. And therefore, the idea of the Brancus head, you know, as a sort of uh, another a type of a different um, material and, and physical uh, uh, form and mass. And so then we generated this <coughs> these two languages, you know, the, the, the nearly the head, the, the, the concrete mass, uh, the monolithic egg nearly, um, which would, through the progress of the project, become more and more organic. You know, instead of trying to keep a formalistic control over what the acousticians keep wanting to, you know, do to this concert hall, and you all keep saying, yeah, yeah, but hang on, I mean, it's going to look funny, that shape on the outside, we set ourselves up a situation where the funnier the better, in a way, or at least the more organic, the better, because the contrast between these two languages became um, interesting. Uh, and then there was an idea of, you know, <coughs> of scale, and, and the, uh, that came around the idea of, of the building being made out of six meter pieces of um, laminated timber. Every piece of timber in the building is six meters long. That, in, s in essence, then gives, you know, sort of human dimension. Well, not many six meter people around, but, um, <coughs> you know, six meters is something one can, you know, cope with. Uh, and then that gives a sort of sense of dimension to the, to the building. And then that skin comes all the way down. The floor of the public spaces is also wood, and it comes right down to the water side. Uh, and then you, you inhabit the interstitial space with foyers and, 
and balconies and stay, you know, you hang out on all these places where, you know, in intervals one wants to hang out on. Um, the problem with hanging out at night on balconies and concert halls is th the only thing you see is a reflection of yourself in the glass. So this double skin of this two, two vertical timbers, the glass sits inside here and is tilted at eight degrees so that um, you don't get a reflection so that, that you, know, you can see between inside and outside. This is a slightly uh, exaggerated idea of the, f the, you know, the egg in the box nearly. Um, I'm more fond of this view, which <coughs> is quite interesting because as you move around this um, uh, building, it becomes, you know, at times much more solid and other times much more transparent. And when we did light tests on it, um, uh, one of the problems when you do a glass building, of course, is the problem about shading and heat buildup. And, you know, essentially this is a glass uh, building uh, with timber mullions. But the density of the mullions was such that we, we didn't need any shading at all, the, sh the mullions actually. The density protects it. Okay, last project. Um, this is Henley <coughs> in England. You can see we're in England by the... the <coughs> <laughs> um, I was selected... This was a... Uh, a competition, an invited competition about eight years ago now. I have to be careful what I say because the client is sitting here. Um, we, we won it um, through an interview, but <coughs> uh, with certain ideas about form. But of course the intimidation from the beginning was how in such a conservative place as Henley, uh, and this one has to remember is the height of Prince Charles's powers as uh, an architect basher and um, uh, pronouncer on all things architectural. Um, how was it possible to get planning permission within um, this context? The one thing that you know I really did enjoy, I must say, is this sort of ten temporary you know village which gets built for the regatta and. There is, of course, as, you know, the other ingredient which was rather beautiful was the idea of you know, a building which would house these wonderful, long, thin uh, boats. The, um, well, more context, that shows you the, the immediate vicinity of, of the building. In fact, this is after the building's built. You can just see the profile of the building here. Uh, here is the site. This is the river. The last photograph was back here. This was the first planning permission. And um, at, at that point, we really had to accept everything the planners told us in order to get um, the permission for a building at all. We're in the middle of a park in the floodplain, and the, the, the principle of permission was already quite difficult to establish. Um, the planners wanted us to push this, the building right back into the trees here and against the railway lines. Um, However, we insisted that the building should come as forward as possible so because the, the access from the town is along this way and here. This meant that we could put the car park behind so that you didn't approach the building across the car park, which was quite an important part of the design, well, it was a fundamental part of the design, which is now being completely screwed up by the council building another car park here. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, the car park that we've been in control of is that one. Um, having got the planning permission for this, where um, uh, the planners have you know, complete control over what one does, we then uh, uh, put it in the bottom drawer. The client didn't have the money to, to build it. And every now and again, we'd get it out of the drawer and put it in for a new planning application. And each time, um, resolved to, to sort of push uh, the project into, into a slightly more abstract dimension. And it became a sort of dialogue. Uh, the interest of the project became between an idea of taking a form which is, on the one hand, rather traditional, and materials which were traditional, and, uh, as it were, p identifying abstract and contemporary possibilities within that. Abstract in terms of you know form making and in terms of uh, space making, but without challenging the notion that uh, it should be possible to do. Uh, you know, a building with uh, a pitch roof. 
one of the one of the ideas of abstraction was to <coughs> um, contrast, on the one hand, uh, a, a, a sort of horizontal space at the ground floor, um, with, on the other hand, a very enclosed space at the upper floor. So to provide exhibition spaces for the boats on the top, uh, with light only coming in from 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 the roof, and to characterise that, as I say, uh, with the this um, much more you know nearly Miesian, um glass there. and uh, something which the planners absolutely hated and, and tried to stop us doing was to abstract by <coughs> pushing the structure back so that um, these these volumes seem like they're sort of heavy you know too heavy for them for the structure <coughs> um, you approach through a ramp here this is the ramp coming up. I should say that the building has now been handed over. The, the exhibition and interior fit-outs will be done in the next um, 12 months, I think. So it's finished, but uh, not occupied. Uh, you know, so this, this shows a slide going in. This is the bridge. That you, so you, you approach. I should say that as we're in the floodplain, the building has to be one and a half meters off the ground, which added to this um, <coughs> um, the sense in my mind that that uh, the material of the building should be wood. I don't know why. I just felt that you know, although there are massive components to it, it's a concrete structure. I still felt that uh, you know the building should express itself as as a sort of lightweight surface building. The other um, dimension of abstraction was to do with you know reducing the details, trying to take the form of the building and. Uh, uh, avoiding conventional, um, you know, junctions of gutters and things like that. If, you know, if it if it has a, a roof in this way, you know, how can one make it as as abstract and as pure as possible? And and that was to do with, you know, identifying uh, ways of tucking gutters behind and and, you know, the, the very detailed concerns of how you put the building together. This is as you approach the building from the car park. Um, you enter through here. Um, we started <coughs> after the building had been, after the, the plans had been sitting in our drawers for about five years. Uh, we got a phone call one day saying someone had come up with the money. And um, uh, then, of course, everyone was in a great hurry to get it built. Um, paradoxical because it's still sitting empty, but <coughs> we built it on time. Um, and even more paradoxically, of course, that, that two thirds of the way through the construction process, um, it was determined that the building was too small and uh, we needed to add something to it. So we, there is a second phase added here and that's what this bridge is. This bridge was added, uh, in fact, during the construction period and we had to plan it um, to as an, uh, literally as an, as an unanticipated add-on that may or may not happen, but it, it actually has happened, is now completed. Um, that's the plans. Here's the ground floor. You enter the stair on one side, the ramp on the other, the entrance hall. This is, you know, this is all the public things, restaurant, uh, sort of um, uh, multi-purpose space here, bookshop and shop here, and uh, temporary exhibition. Uh, on the upstairs, we just provided <coughs> the largest uh, spaces we could imagine, and. Uh, Given again, we, we we didn't know and still don't really know what's going to go inside it, but on the basis that boats are long and thin generally, I thought it was a fairly safe bet to make uh, long, thin exhibition spaces. Um, that explains the caricature of these two types of of space. On the one hand, this you know open horizontal space at the ground floor, and on the other hand, this you know enclosed exhibition space. Uh, I think this image shows the concern that we had to try and find a balance between making a building which in many ways could be described as um, you know, vernacular and yet invest it with a sort of classical um, quality and, and that was the di has been the dialogue all the way through the development of the project. This is the building we added on to second phase. You can just see the bridge here and the connection. So looking back to the first phase. Um, it's all clad in wet uh, oak, in green oak, which dries on the building. Uh, 
Um, it's a much less cubic building than, than many of them, but still I think there's been a continuous um, concern uh, between the building form and the, and the enclosure of space and what those spaces might be. And, and I think I've described that in some ways, you know, that was a sort of characterization of two types of spaces. There's something rather amazing about being one and a half meters off the ground because you have essentially, you know, a ground level view, but it's abstracted. You, know, you don't see the roots of the tree, for instance. You don't have a, a normal perspective and yet you're not one floor up where you've got obviously got you know, a view down on something. So <coughs> what's rather nice, and I, I can't really claim any um, authorship of this whatsoever, um, apart from always wanting to um, emphasize the openness and, and to, you know, as I've said before, to try and confiscate the, the, the context into the building, that the ground floor does sort of um, take this. And I think that the horizontality and that horizontality is emphasized by the fact that we, all of the concrete, uh, all of the ceilings are in concrete and exposed concrete, which again gives a sort of weight, nearly a sort of momentous weight to the, to the, to the ceiling, which, you know, you get the feeling that you're sandwiched between two substantial material planes. And that contrasts with uh, moving upstairs or up the lift to the two exhibition halls. Uh, this is the arrival, that's the reception, the stairs going up here and the exhibition halls are at the top. Um, as I say, they're not finished yet, so they're... Uh, um, it was always, I always felt that as it was a building in, you know, that you would visit uh, nearly, you know, off the park or having walked by the river or on a day out to Henley, that it should be... Uh, you know, a daylit and very bright experience. Of course, that is always in conflict with curator curatorial fashions of um, d display. Uh, and of course, curators can always make much more exciting uh, installations in darker spaces. Um, the, there's a certain compromise in this where, where by reflecting the light and getting the light onto these surfaces, that by the time it's bounced down again, um, there's a sort of perceptual um, lightness of the building, uh, of the space, even though the light levels down here might be quite, um, quite low and quite acceptable. I'm going to finish there, but I'm not going to let you get away quite that easily. I'm just going to read... <coughs> I'm going to do the one thing one should never do, is <coughs> read a bit of text. Um, but given that this is meant to be a launch of this magazine, I'm going to read the <coughs> one small piece of text which... which um, uh, is at the back, and it tries um, to define uh, what I believe is a relationship between architecture and ideology and the role of architecture. <coughs> and it's called Manifest Significance. Um, while feeling uncomfortable with most descriptions of architectural performance, the two words manifest and significance give clues to a possible description. Suspicious of deterministic rhetoric implying a performance description of architecture, and cautious of descriptions that invoke timeless and eternal qualities, I hold on to these two simple words. In our postmodernist world, we have become increasingly comfortable with the idea that our creative efforts are not part of a coordinated ideological crusade. That we operate within, whether we like it or not, a strongly prescribed political and economic system is undisputed. It is characteristic of ideology to negate itself as such and represent an historic moment as inevitable, non-ideological non non nature. Capitalism itself may therefore not be an ideological agenda that we positively regard and represent, yet it is a consequence of ideas that we ad it is its consequence of ideas that we adhere to, such as democracy, freedom of speech, and individual rights. This warm environment humbles even the most avant-garde project that works within this system. We cannot pretend to be really radical while operating within rules, within these rules. We can question these rules, we can push boundaries, we can look for meaning and significance in those things which make up our world. Accepting the ideological framework, we are destined to examine and articulate its possibilities. Realizing attempts to work against it invalidate the very nature of architecture, we must find ways of making our concerns visible and the possibilities manifest. Architecture cannot openly bite the hand that feeds it. It is not a singular act. 
It is a conspiracy of conditions, both economic and creative. It requires the consent and participation of many people outside of the creative center. It is as a consequence of this reality that we must, if we operate conventionally with clients and construction industry, accept the reality of our situation. This said, we are surrounded by architecture that can only be excused by the fact that it represents nothing more than our situation. Buildings that do no more than what they need to, an environment devoid of vision, representing only the dominant values of capitalist ideology. It is an attempt to redress, to contest the dominance of the cynical values within this system that we can operate, to speak up for other values that are not necessarily political, but explicitly humanistic, to give voice to considerations that make our individual and social lives as participants and occup occupants of this world more vivid, more significant. It is within this space that we must operate, not to suggest an architecture based on a false ideology, but to identify opportunities and articulate architectural qualities that bring this world and its values within our understanding and realization. It is to infuse the simple process of architecture with meaning to make significance manifest. Thank you very much. Um, last week, when uh, Paul Smith, the fashion designer, gave his talk, at the end of it, he had <coughs> two bags, and in those bags, there were ties and shirts and everything, and for every student who asked the question, they got one present from Paul Smith. So, uh, David, what have you um, got for the students tonight? <laughs> Free copies of the uh, I'm book sure, for every yeah, question? A year subscription to the air. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Who is going to uh, maybe have a few questions? I'm sure that everyone wants to rush downstairs and get the signed copies of the book. But uh, let's have a few questions. Don't have to. No, no, I'm sure. Do we have the uh, microphone? I No, I know, but people won't be able to hear you. Do you find that the use of uh, concrete, or as you've used concrete in Japan, is uh, much different from here, the quality of the concrete, the, um, the craftsmen, the way they're able to um, actually do what you want them to do? Was it like a, a learning experience for you to work in Japan with concrete? Um, uh, concrete's very difficult, and yes, Japan is, you know, it's a, it's a vernacular material. It's, it's difficult not to use concrete. And, um, but more than that, <coughs> the, the climate suits it because uh, here, you know, um, we have three or four months of winter rain and gray skies and in February, any piece of concrete looks, you know, unbelievably depressing. Uh, in Japan, the rainy season is in sort of summer and the winter, in contrast, you know, is dry and very blue skies. So, you know, in the summer, it somehow seems more acceptable that concrete gets wet. And it's not. So, you know, I would answer that I think concrete's not really a material. I've just, we're doing a building in, in Dusseldorf in concrete, in shattered concrete. Um, but that's because I wanted to make a sort of dirty building in the Docklands. You know, I, I somehow wanted the, the, the roughness because it's meant to be a sort of artist studio building. And I wanted to do something that wasn't <laughs> um, like a sort of slick office building. And again, it's, you know, I think all of the projects I show, there's a sort of, um, you know, a, we, ne we never use um, you know, any panel system or anything, not because I have, you know, I think a anything's up for grabs, you know, but um, those projects, you know, the sm smaller projects especially, you know, we tend to start with a material, and yes, concrete's one of those. Um, not that one would use it much here, apart from, you know, interior. Well, you can get good concrete here. It's just much more expensive because there's no, there's no use. You know, they're not used to doing it. And concrete is a risk material. Um, if you make anything in concrete, the contractor has to allow for the fact that he might have to do it more than once. Um, and if one's rigorous about that, you know, on the Rome Museum, we we had to condemn a lot of the concrete. But finally, the, w the reason we were so tough the first time round was that the, they had to, you know, there's a, an exposed concrete 
ceiling and, and if we, once we cast that there was no way that we were going to ever condemn it so we had to sort of be as aggressive as possible on any blemishes on the first time but it's a much more normal thing and, um, but the f I got it wrong in the, fir the first project I did Ando came and had a look at it and um, sort of tut tutted and walked away <laughs> and um, it sort of called my office and said he's willing to help us on the next one <laughs> which he did you know, and it was um, made a lot easier He wants to know who, else, you know, who, would, who would slot into this category of people concerning themselves with manifest significance. Um, I, think that it, I, I, I think that there is a large body of work uh, of modern architects who have, um, you know, suffer from a criticism, I suppose at one level, it could be, you know, it's sort of said, yes, but it's sort of, it's modern movement without, you know, ideology. Um, and I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that um, I think it's just we've learnt the definition or the appropriateness of ideology and, and where ideas can operate within architecture, the limits of architecture. I think, you know, there is a much more modest generation. You know, Herzog Demeron, for instance, are probably the most radical of the architects who still, you know, I would still argue, um, demonstrate their ideas through the architecture. There's a sensuousness there, which is, you know, absolutely clear. There are others where that phenomenological quality is even more profound, you know, someone like Peter Zumthor. Um, but the Swiss, you know, I mean, there's millions of them just sort of doing wonderful stuff. And I think <coughs> I would say the same in Spain, you know, there's lots of architects doing... But I mean, one of the d depressing things in this country is that, is that there isn't a sort of normal architecture. It's a climate for, you know, exotic birds. It's not you know, um, we can produce Fosters and Grimshaws and things like this, but um, it's very difficult, you know, whereas in Spain, you know, there's a hundred architects all producing, you know, architecture at a certain, you know, very, very good uh, daily level, you know, really high quality stuff and go to any small Spanish city and find, you know, half a dozen fantastic buildings. Well, you can't do that here. And, and there's, a dis there's a disjunction here between you know, the culture that, that commissions and, and the culture that works. And it's, it's, it's self-fulfilling. Because once you've sort of been told, you know, I was told one time, after the Bristol competition, I was told by the judge, the architectural judge, who absolutely fought for me for five hours, um, that uh, my mistake was to talk about architecture. I spent too long talking about architecture. Well, what a strange place where, you know, you can't win a, an architectural competition because you talk about architecture. You've got to talk about speed of construction, management skills, you know, things like this. We just lost a competition today to a high-tech architect who I won't mention, his name and begins with G. Um, <laughs> uh, for, and the excuse was exactly the same. Well, we were very impressed with his management, uh, you know, his ability to deliver the project on time, on cost. Great. And, you know, that's the way that one has to talk about architecture. You know, in, in Spain, I don't think that's true. You know, Moneo ran a small office and runs a small office without having to, you know, impress potential clients that he's got 15 computers. And, you know, and I, I think that's a... Sorry, I'm straying from your question. I'm really... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things that you were saying at the beginning, uh, when you were talking about the time of uh, being a student and, in a sense, the previous generation of people in the UK or teachers, there seemed to be also the idea of, uh, of, a, of a slightly sort of different agenda. We might call it the social agenda and so on. What, what, I what is, at the moment, this emphasis on, 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 on architecture itself? Where is, though, in your work, the role of urbanism for you? Uh, it seems to me that that's something that makes it easier in a way in Barcelona is, is precisely that there is in fact a kind of context there. Is this something that you feel you should uh, yourself play uh, um, a, a kind of more systematic role in, in terms of the, the, uh, the significance of urbanism in some way? 
Well, I think the problem is, you know, when you're in a culture where there is no notion of, you know, public realm represented by, you know, the state, then I think that's a problem. I mean, the closest we're now getting is, uh, you know, public buildings propped up by, you know, lottery taxation, you know, which, you know, everyone's very grateful for. But it's not necessarily a process which um, one feels is that civic or public spirited. It's often, a, you know, um, a process to prop up um, cultural institutes that otherwise should be supported by, you know, other methods. Um, no, I, th I think it's a, it's a th the lack of confidence in a social agenda, and the, or in, in this country, the, the lack of social agenda, and you know, nearly the handing over. You know, I mean, Thatcher basically handed over um, the city to developers. Said, well, you know, do with it what you can, because you guys, well, you know, you'll make money. You know, it's a privatization of the city. Um, you know, in, in the Thatcher years, there was more construction in the city of London than there had been since the war. Um, so we can't complain that there's not buildings going on here, but how do you expect um, good architecture to come out of um, speculation? And, um, but what about the offices? Don't you feel that it's possible for, I mean, shouldn't an office like yours do more theoretical or uh, speculative projects that uh, are not somehow sanctioned by the state, but they come from your practice? Moisin, it's difficult enough to stay alive. <laughs> Doing what we're doing, yeah, you're right. You know, and um, but we do participate in in competitions a lot, uh, and especially abroad because you know there, there's a slightly more urbanistic basis often to foreign competitions. But um, you know, give me an urban project and I'll, I'll do an urban you know proposal. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, maybe this could be good. Um, I Kenneth Frampton refers to your work as the reflective practice despite the situation in architecture in England. Would you consider yourself as, a, as an architect who follows critical regionalist approach, as defined by Frampton? Um, what I think, <coughs> what I tried to say in the lecture, there was that, um, I mean, I can't be that regionalist because, you know, I don't do very much work here, so it's very difficult to have developed, you know, a body of work based in one's culture. In fact, that's absolutely what I haven't done. You know, I haven't been able to do that. However, I still regard myself as an English architect and therefore I'm, you know, I'm trying to balance the opportunities of building in strange places within some, you know, uh, giving this some logic and significance within, you know, the body of work that I've got. Um, I certainly, uh, have sympathy with what you know, with what one understands Frampton to, un to mean by that, um, and I suppose that's in a way it's a localization of ideology as much as anything, which is exactly what I think, you know. I think that we've become uh, much more um, cautious about what one might believe architecture can promise, and much more excited about what it can actually you know make, and I, I think. In a way, I think that's nearly the first thing. I mean, when I was at school, it was very difficult to find, um, you know, a modern architectural heritage in England. It was very difficult to take students and show them beautiful objects of modern architecture, cherished. You know, you know, there are, of course, you know, the Leicesters and the, you know, the, but in the end, what, where was the evidence on the ground? You know, where is your you know, when Prince Charles's modern architecture is awful, you know, where is the evidence to say, no, it's not, look at this, look at that, look at that. Now, there are some, you know, you can drag people there, but not as much as one would, would like to believe. So I think, in a way, my feeling is, as a practitioner, you know, before you can fly, you've got to walk, and maybe these last years, and I, I think I've seen it happening in Europe, and I think it's an identifiable trend amongst the younger generation, which is to reinvest <coughs> architecture with a sort of, you know, yeah, confidence, a sort of material and, and physical confidence. And maybe, you know, that allows us to, to be, take on other agendas with more, with more confidence. But in my, my mind, there's nothing sadder than, than uh, something which sets out to do something which it can't possibly do. And, and, and I think the modern movements sort of witness too many of those. 
Okay. Um, well, maybe we should stop at this point. I'm sure that David would be very happy to answer questions while he's signing the book After downstairs. Yes. Thank you.